Good. So we're on Instagram and we are on YouTube. Thanks for joining, guys. Quick disclaimer before we get started. Again, I'm Rob Tatro. Uh, Rob Tatro, robtatro.com, head of the Tatro Wealth Advisor Group. We got a couple different um, formats happening here. So if you see me kind of glancing everywhere, quick disclaimer don't take this as personal advice for your situation. Uh, I don't know your situation. Now, if you're a client of mine, great. We could have a bit of chat and we could talk about it offline. But if you're not a client, don't take this as investment advice. I don't know what you have. I don't know what you own. I don't know who you are. So anyways, thanks a lot for, for joining guys on uh, on Facebook, on Instagram over here, both of you guys uh, on my personal feed and on the Tatro feed. So um, let's get started right away here. I'm going to give you guys my overall view and then uh, I'm just going to kind of, this is supposed to be a Q&A session. So I'm asking you guys to um, get me your questions, your thoughts. Uh, I, I had a question. Uh, I've been getting some questions online already. Uh, before the event. So uh, I'm going to start right off the bat. First of all, how many people here are working from home? Give me a shout out if you're actually working from home right now. Anyone working from home? Are you guys just quarantined? All right. Nobody is. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, good to see you, Mike Fuadel. Good to see you, Ken Teller, Johnny Mox as well. Denis Jadfal, good to see you guys. Thanks for joining. Yeah, some people working from home. Absolutely. Good, good. Oh, they're coming in. Okay, perfect. So what we're saying, what we're obviously seeing here is for sure um, unprecedented, definitely in terms of impact on society. So what I'd like to not do today, I'd like to not, as best as I can, one, I'm not going to mention stocks. I'm not going to mention individual securities. Uh, I'm not going to mention, uh, I will mention sectors. I will mention asset allocation. I will mention strategies. I will mention stock prices, movements generally, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, specifically talking about individual stocks. So this is not market call on BNN where I can give you guys, you know, my top 10 picks for the next month or two. It's not what we want to do here. We want to answer questions about, about asset allocation, what's actually happening in the market, price discrepancies that we're seeing. Um, and I'm also, so I'm not going to give you guys specific advice on that. And um, ideally what I could get is uh, I'm not going to talk also about the actual impact of the virus and what I think is going to happen, how many people are going to die, uh, how many people are, you know, are going to be impacted. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not going to pretend I am. You guys have read a bunch of stuff online as well. Everyone's reading. Everyone's Googling stuff. So the idea is for us to be having a discussion about the impacts of investments. So uh, I'm going to open up the floor to any questions that anyone's got right now with respect to investments. If not, I'm going to get started. Uh, in the meantime, I'll get started right now about my overall macroeconomic outlook as to what's happening. First of all, uh, corrections like this, by the way, this is open open floor for you guys to ask any questions, right? Corrections like this have happened about uh, 10%, uh, 10 times ever in our lives. So we're talking about a 33, 34-ish percent correction right now. As I speak, I do have my BNN up here and I am watching it on the side here. Uh, the markets are down again today. I guess the good news with respect to today is that we're not seeing, you know, 2,000 points or 3,000 points like we've been seeing kind of lately. But we are still seeing uh, movement in the stock price. So what is causing that? You guys know this. You guys likely know what is causing these movements. It's uncertainty. It's the human effect. So I don't need to tell you guys that, but I'm going to tell you guys regardless. We're now at 33%, 34% market correction. Okay. So that's happened 10 times ever. The last 10 times, um, they've been kind of, you know, 1929 was the first time this happened. You know, that was an 80% correction. It took 34 months for it to come back um, after the war. So during the war, we saw a 30% correction. That took 37 months to come back. That was World War II. Uh, if we keep going, uh, 1962, there was Cold War jitters, Cuban Missile Crisis, fears, uh, 30%, 29 30%. And you know that took about six months to get back. If we keep going, um, you know, late into 73, 74, there was, you know, Arab oil embargoes, energy prices went soaring, the opposite of what we're seeing right now, lengthy recession. That was a 48% uh, correction. Nobody talks about the oil embargo correction, but it's actually bigger than most of the other ones that you've heard of. You know, my dad were here. He remembers the oil embargo. He remembers, you know, 87. 87 uh, is the next one. So 87 was, happened basically overnight, happened extremely quick. We had a 23% correction in one day. So to put that into perspective, last week was a fairly bad week relative to the markets. It was the worst week 
since the Great Depression, it was 17%. That was a 17% correction last week. Um, this happened in one day. Uh, my dad always tells the stories. He remembers how it was that day on, you know, on the trading floor and it, it just wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop. 23% in one day would be, you know, when we were at 30,000 points, that'd be, you know, just under a quarter, that'd be like 7,000 points or so on the index. So it's a lot of movement for sure. And we're not, it's quicker than we've seen in every single instance, except 87. So 87 happened one day and then a couple, couple good bounce back days. But uh, this one right here is quicker than we've ever seen. And uh, I'll just, there's a couple of questions here coming. Uh, Canadian U.S. federal intervention have an impact. So this is Simon Clayton. Thanks for asking the question, Simon. Two interventions got announced. Um, first of all, there's two kind of sides to the intervention. First of all, let's talk about the U.S. Fed or the Bank of Canada. They are the monetary policy. So they decide how many dollars are printed, you know, what they should be buying. Should they be buying assets with our dollars and, you know, what they should be doing. Whereby the government, Canadian government, U.S. government, other governments, they announce stimulus packages. They'll announce tax cuts. They'll say small businesses don't have to pay taxes. They'll say, you know, we're going to send everyone a check. Um, all of that is what's happening. Two separate fields. So first of all, let's talk about the U.S. Fed and the Canadian, the Bank of Canada. So the U.S. Fed. Uh, are, are announced this morning, unprecedented, a blank check. Basically, we will write whatever amount you want, whatever amount we need to write to buy back bonds, fixed income, assets, balance sheets to make sure that there is liquidity in the market. And I'll get to liquidity later, but that's an unprecedented move. And in my mind, it's helping prop the markets today. Um, so Simon, to answer your question on that front, the Fed intervention, Definitely. Now we're talking about government intervention. I firmly believe right now where we are, you know, it's not a surprise if I tell you that there's going to be a lot of unemployment, a lot of unemployment. We're going to have kind of two choices. We're either going to go down the path of, um, you know, we'll, we'll take care of those we can or something like that, or we'll go kind of something more the Denmark route, which is going to be some sort of level of, of you know, universal, everyone gets something and you know, no one is going to be hungry. No one's going to be without food. In Canada, I would, if I were, I'm not a gambling person, but if I was, I'm, I'm going to guess that we're going to more likely to go that way um, with respect to just making sure everyone's taken care of for however long it takes. Because here's the thing, guys, I don't know how long this is going to take, and I'm not going to bullshit you, and I'm not going to tell you that it's going to last one month or three months or six months or 12 months. I have no idea. And I'm not an infectious disease specialist, although in my spare time in the Canadian CMV Foundation, I do a ton uh, of work with pediatric infectious diseases, specifically because CMV is the number one cause of infant disability, and it is a, an infectious disease. So I have met some of these people, and they're just, just not to sound like Trump, but they're wonderful people. Uh, and they do just phenomenal work, and they're working 24-7 right now. So I'm not an expert, but I know that it's going to last a while. And when we had 500,000 unemployment applications last week, Think of you guys and your friends and your family. How many of them are out of work? Um, you know, just on my hockey team, a couple of guys told me this week that they've lost their, they're, they're being laid off. So this is happening to everyone and I'm, I'm, it's going to continue to happen for sure. So to the answer to your question, the federal intervention, will it have an impact? I believe it's propping up the market right now. And I believe that, it, that the U.S. government intervention, the Canadian government intervention, they won't have a choice but to, to intervene. And it's going to be something we've never, ever, ever seen. The level of money that we're going to put towards this, this program. We're talking four or five trillion in the U.S. for support. We're talking, you know, maybe 10-ish percent of that in Canada, half a bill, maybe up to, you know, maybe up to three quarters of a, of a trill in Canada, half a, half a trill, maybe up to three quarters of a trill in Canada. Those are numbers that are unheard of. Um, and, you know, you, you go back to the world wars when, we had to fight, we, I wasn't alive, sorry, not we, the collective we, we had to fight against, you know, maybe losing our livelihood forever. And we spent up to 30, 35% of the GDP in one year. So now we're talking about measures that are going to be three, four, five, six percent of the GDP. This feels like a ton of money, but there's a lot more room for that. So Simon, uh, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, I'll try to get to the next question here. Uh, I believe that's Yannick. Given the nature of this correction, how does one compare this correction to the other ones you mentioned? So on a percentage level, uh, on a percentage level, I have a chart here for that. 
Yeah. And by the way, all of these charts, um, if you have any interest, put a comment in there. I'm happy to send you some of these stuff. Like I, I'm a, I'm a sucker for information. I love, love, love info. And uh, I love data. Um, my brother, those of you who know my brother, Charlie, he's a big, big data guy. Um, so we're, you know, I'm looking at the worst corrections in the history and they, they kind of start at 80% with the great depression, but the majority of them are in a 30 to 40% range of the worst corrections ever. Now, what I really like to see is the forward returns from the bottom. When you get to the bottom forward returns, your one year number on average of these, these 12 bear markets has been 52%. Your three year number, 88%. So we're talking total returns from the bottom to the following one year is 52, three years is 86, and the five year number is 132%. So it's, uh, I don't know where the bottom is again, guys, and we can talk a bit more later if someone wants to know uh, about how and when you do see a bottom. But when that bottom hits, you could be sure that there's going to be some really positive forward returns. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it for everyone today. Uh, I'm just going to say that we could talk a bit about the bottom because that's what everyone wants to know, right? Rob, when are we hitting the bottom? Um, Life at Lake of the Woods. Uh, thanks for joining. MC Bruce, thanks for joining. Rick Kaiser, thanks for joining. Uh, other people here, Grant. Hey, good to see you, Grant. Guy Bourgeois, uh, thanks for joining, guys. I'll get to the uh, next question here. Where should we be investing right now to offset the losses that we are experiencing? So I'm going to tell you what we are doing generally for our clients. Do not take this as investment advice for you personally. I don't know what you have and what you do. Ken Teller, good to see you. Uh, but I will say this. So our view is that this is unprecedented generational opportunity to buy quality assets. Now, there's two ways you can play this. To answer your question, uh, Mishiko, Mishiko, you could play this two ways. You could either say, I'm going to buy airlines, casinos, uh, carnival cruise companies, cruise companies, and I'm going to make five, 10 times my money when this thing comes back because they are down. Some of those are down 70, 80, 90 percent. So maybe that's how you want to play it. And, and that's what I would call speculating. That's speculating because I don't know. I don't know for sure if, if those are going to come back. Silver B, thanks for joining. Um, we don't know for sure if those carnival cruises, those airlines, we don't know if they're going to come back. I think they are. In the gut of my gut, I, I do believe that we are going to fly again, and there's amazing opportunity there. But for now, right? For now, here let's let's focus on quality. Is what we're preaching. There are some real, real high quality names that have fallen 30, 35, 40 uh, percent from some sectors. You know, real estate, financials, infrastructure, insurance companies. Those are all companies, sectors that generally come out of these things in really, really, really good shape. So do I know for sure how the bottom's going to look, what these companies are going to do, how they're going to bounce back? I don't, but I know one, they're paying extremely solid dividends. I also know two, I don't think that the government can let those companies go bankrupt, even if we get to a point where they are. By the way, I don't think that's going to happen. I do think we're going to get back to normal at some point here, and these companies will be profitable. But regardless, when this thing turns around, you're going to want to have been paid a dividend in the meantime. You're going to want to have gotten that yield, whether through a dividend stock or real estate, you know, and you're going to make the capital appreciation when life gets back to normal. Yeah, but Rob, when is that? When does life get back to normal? I don't know. I don't know, but it will happen. So uh, to answer your question about where should we be investing, our view on that is um, we're sticking to quality. We're sticking to quality. We're sticking to, and we're also legging it. So we're doing it in two ways. One, we stick to quality, typically dividend payers. If we're doing it in the US, we typically want to focus on sec sector, sector as a whole. We'll do it ETFs. Also, you have to worry about currency right now. Currency currency is a problem. Thank you for joining uh Joseph Gray, Duco, and uh, Daniela Graham. Appreciate that. Um, you have to worry about currency because currency is something that, you know, currency has moved so much right now. Currency was one of my questions that I got through over the night. The, the U.S. dollar has gotten so strong, and you guys know why the dollar is so strong, right? I'm sure. Someone give me a quick reason why the, the I feel like I'm teaching class here. That's what my wife is doing today at home with with our our, our kids. She's she's teaching them school. Um, the U.S. dollar is so strong because it's a safe haven, right? People are selling their stocks. 
people are selling their bonds, people are selling their real estate, people are selling everything right now, and they are going to either the safe havens. The safe havens typically have been U.S. Treasuries, uh, typically have been just straight USD. So we're talking cash in a USD account that has so much influx, and people are selling the Canadian dollar. And as a result, we see the Canadian dollar hovering in the mid 68s. So um, uh, to, to talk about the strategy, to get back to your question, uh, Mashiko, we suggest legging in. What does legging in mean? We suggest whatever money you have in the sidelines that you are willing to invest, write that number down on a piece of paper, whatever it is. I don't care if you're a starting investor or you're, you know, you're a retiree or you're 50 years old. What is that number that you have on the sideline? Is it half a mil? Is it 10 mil? Is it five grand? Whatever that number is, write it down and do half of that is what we're suggesting at or near these prices. All right. If this is cash that you want to do half or a portion of that at or near these prices. So you do a portion of that and now you're invested. Okay. Good to see you, Dave. Um, so you, now you're invested. You got half of that invested in the market. One of two things will happen. We're either not at the bottom and we can get to that in a second. Um, and then you'll have more ammo to purchase or we're somewhere close to the bottom and then you'll have participated somewhat in the rise of the equities. What you do not want to happen, folks, what you do not want to happen is for you to be in a position where you've saved this money, you've accumulated wealth, you've got cash and you were prudent and you kept it out of the market. And now you finally get this unprecedented opportunity to invest. And what do you do? You wait. You wait too long and then you miss the rally. That's what we do not want to happen. I know how hard it is in the pit of your stomach. It's incredibly painful right now. Deep down in here, I shouldn't be tapping this. This is a microphone. Um, you know, it, it hurts down here or somewhere in your legs or, you know, it hurts to, 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 to even think about putting money in the market right now. And that's why we are seeing stock market move dramatically down. No one's buying. No one's buying, right? So you guys know how the stock market works, right? You have bids on one side, you have ask on another side. If you have people that are buying, more people that are buying than selling, we see a rise. And if we see the opposite, we see a fall. But when you have no one, no one buying, you get what we saw in the last two weeks, which is a free fall, just a drop like a stone. Now, at some point, so, so no one's buying. You guys aren't buying. No one's buying. We have started prudently adding to our clients' portfolios this week, and we expect to do a little bit more in the next few weeks. What we did, those of you that are clients, you guys know this, but we had put some cash aside uh, in the last year. Let's call it the last year. A bunch of different ways, just straight cash or alternatives. Um, straight cash alternatives, fixed income. We didn't know. Like I'll be lying to you if I said that I knew this would happen. I'd be lying if I said I knew there'd be a 35% correction. I had no clue. But we just felt valuations were a little stretched. So as a result of that, you know, we had a bit of cash. So now that we have that, I'm repeating my advice to you to answer your question, uh, Mishiko. Where should we be investing? Not only where, how. Be prudent. Be prudent. Leg in. You want to reduce your market timing risk here. Now, if you're a gambler and you just want to put it on the market today and you're like, you know what? I'm comfortable with owning, you know, Royal Bank at a six yield. Whoops. I specifically said I wouldn't talk about stocks. Disregard the last mention about Royal Bank. But, uh, you know, if you say I'm comfortable owning a Canadian bank at a 7% yield, or I'm comfortable owning an infrastructure company, you know, at a, at a eight yield, or I'm comfortable owning a real estate company at a 14 yield. If you're comfortable owning that long term, then you know, feel free to not worry less about market timing. But for most of you, I think market timing uh, is a risk that you could face. Um, I'll go to the next question here. How's everyone on Instagram doing? You guys hear me over here? Uh, this is my Rob Tatro personal. You guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Joss, Nicola, Bridget. All right, thanks for joining. Over here, Dan Talfaya, you guys, Kenny, you guys can hear me okay? Perfect. Somebody give me a shout out or something or a sign of life on one of these Instagram channels. Uh, let's get to the next question. Uh, aftermath, job loss, um, mortgage defaults, recession, um, currently priced into the market. This is another question or more damage. So remember that the market is a 24-hour 24 hour instrument that is always trading and is always a reflection of people's views and values. People's views and values about what 
an individual investment is worth. Okay. All right. Mac Andre, good to see you, buddy. Um, so these stocks are being reflected. So if I think I think a stock is worth more, I can go and buy it. Therefore, the stock will improve. So the entire market is a reflection of the future value of these securities, the current value and the future value of these securities, right? So everything that we know, that you guys know, that you've read, that you guys have read online is priced into the market. So to answer your question, job loss, mortgage defaults, recession, that is what you're seeing. When I point over here, I'm pointing to my TV that has the markets currently, currently moving, but that is currently driving the selling. So when you see that, hey, Christine, when you see that, it is extremely, extremely uh, difficult for you to make a statement that the market is not pricing in. You're basically saying that you know more than the market, right? If you're saying, I know for sure that the market is going to fall or I know for sure that the market's going to go up, you're basically saying, I know more than the market. That's a tough game to play because right now, right now, the stocks are not trading at any rational valuation. They are not. They're not trading at any rational valuation. They're trading on no multiples. Sorry, I was just reading a comment here. Uh, they're not trading on a multiple. They're not trading on anything uh, that makes sense historically, right? So if you're saying that you disagree with the valuation that you're seeing, you're basically saying, you know, I know more than that because it's not trading at a rational level right now. Guys, what's your preference right now? Give me a quick comment. USD or CAD? Would you rather have US dollars right now or Canadian dollars right now? Can I get a quick can I get a quick comment from you guys? If you had US dollars right now, would you be converting right now or would you be keeping it? Dollars are at 68 cents. How do we feel about the future of the economy? Hey David, good to see you David. Anyone? Anyone want to give me a comment as to how they'd feel about USD, we got some USD comments, USD comments, USD. Yeah, so uh, got some highs. Oh, all right, I figured it out. I figured out this Facebook thing right on. Good to see you guys over here. Uh, sorry about the bad angle, but it's it's working. So now we got we got all the all the uh, the venues happening here. Here's what I think about US dollar, and I'm going to tell you also what our analyst thinks. Feel free to get this comment if you'd like. Um, you know. Let's talk about two things for US dollar, Canadian dollar. So everyone here looks like they're saying US dollar, US dollar, US dollar, US dollar. Okay, Japanese yen, one comment. <laughs> it's my Uncle Alex. Um, yeah, maybe, Alex, who knows? Let's talk, let's stick to USD right now and CAD. So historically, the Canadian dollar is typically not this oversold. So oversold meaning um, on a relative strength index, so relative to they call it the Big Mac index. So basically, what are you able to buy in Canada versus in the US? Have you guys ever heard of the Big Mac index? Big Mac index, does that mean something to you? So that means taking a dollar in Canada, crossing the border, converting it to US dollars, and buying a Big Mac. They call it the Big Mac index. It could be really anything you want. You know, at some point, if those numbers get too far out of whack, the currency, especially Canadian and US, have a measure of self-balancing them out. They become, uh, they, you know, the, the lower the Canadian dollar goes, the more buyers come in in Canada, right? So it's got a, a bit of a natural checks and balance system, as my dad would call it. So the Big Mac test right now, the Canadian dollar is, is oversold, but I know what you guys are all saying. I know what everyone is saying. You're all saying USD. You're saying USD likely because you don't like the prospects long-term of our Canadian economy. I'm going to talk to you about two two things with respect to the Canadian dollar. Um, this is Martin Roberge. So he is our, uh, I don't want to mess up his title. He's uh, managing director uh, at Canaccord and our, our North American portfolio strategist. So the, the comment that, that he made short term is typically there'll be a bump here. There'll be a bump here on the Canadian dollar just because it's so oversold. So if your play is to trade the Canadian, trade the US dollar, which I don't suggest you guys do, but if your play is that, then you know there could be a bump here short term where the Canadian dollar appreciates and the US dollar US dollar depreciates. That being said, long term, our view is that uh, we have an account deficit, both uh, on a trade deficit and our we're going to have a fiscal deficit. We're going to have a, a tremendous fiscal deficit that's going to be coming up here, 
Historically, when that's happened, our dollar has not been high historically. So uh, long-term, the fundamentals for the Canadian economy, um, hopefully I'm not surprising anyone when I say this, but I mean, they're, they're not fantastic given the amount, the percentage, uh, percentage of our percentage of our exposure to the uh, to the Western Canadian oil and gas play. So hopefully that that gives you a bit of guidance with respect to US dollar Canadian dollar. But that being said, again, I don't know what'll happen long term, but I, I you know, we we were quite confident when the dollar was at 75 that and this kind of started happening that there was no way that we wanted to we wanted to sell. Cuz remember the Canadian dollar was at 80 really not that long ago. We were in a range from 78 to 82 for a good a good period of time, I want to say probably 18 months or something like that. Uh, I don't know the exact duration, but we were in a range for a while. Um, thank you, Stephen, for the compliment that I'm looking great from all angles. I do feel that there's got to be an angle that, that trims my second neck. It's got to be a way, right? Anyways, uh, maybe I should start working out in my basement. Um, let's get to the next question here. Uh, I had a question earlier about... Um, I just want to get this right here. Uh, liquidity and specific asset classes. Okay, so this is a question that came in. Um, this one came in earlier. So what's happening to the fixed income market? Why are we seeing? So first of all, fixed income, we're talking about bonds, bonds or preferred shares. So what's happening to the bond market? Um, the bond market is, it a, is a somewhat illiquid uh, market in Canada. So illiquid means less bids, less sales, right? So if you have an extremely illiquid stock, there are times when you'll go what's called no bid on a stock. No bid. I'm like uh, like the guy in the movie. No bid. Um, when the stock goes no bid, you're basically trading at zero because nobody wants to buy that stock. Now, that doesn't happen with bonds, but there's less bids. So when you have guaranteed investments, this has happened right now in the Canadian fixed income space, some guaranteed investments. Some fixed income instruments are trading at a 10 to 15% discount. Now, these are guaranteed instruments, short duration. You can get some really nice corporate debt. I mean, most of you, I shouldn't say most of you, I don't know what your individual situation is, but if you have any exposure to equity, any exposure to equity whatsoever, and you're thinking of getting out, obviously I would I would argue against that, you know, and I've said it before, but I could I could speak to it again. But one place. That, that will likely see an appreciation. And I don't want to say like, I mean, it, they're guaranteed investments. So if, if the world falls apart and we let some of these people go bankrupt, some of these companies go bankrupt, yeah, there might be some defaults rates. You know, I certainly don't anticipate 10 to 15% of Canadian companies going bankrupt. I, I just don't see that happening. But if you believe, like I do, that the Canadian economy uh, and the Canadian government won't allow some of these massive companies like Manulite, massive insurance companies, massive Canadian banks, massive companies that have billion dollar balance sheets. If, if you believe like I do that, that the government will not let them go bankrupt, um, then those are phenomenal plays. Like those are going to be unbelievable purchases. So if you own some of that, you know, I would advise you not to sell it uh, on the fixed income. Um, question here. Uh, from David DeMello, would you consider selling a position at a steep loss and buying another position for potential higher return? So this would be kind of the selling your airlines and going into like a bank stock question. So the answer is not that simple, David, but I'll, I'll try to address your question. Basically, it depends. That's a terrible answer. And I apologize for giving you a terrible answer, but it depends. So if those positions no longer make sense with your investment picture, you know, if someone's retired and, and th those are these speculative positions right now in your portfolio, those are extremely speculative. I think people are going to go back to Vegas and people are going to go back to casinos and Achaeans. I think people are going to go back to the strip and go back to flying. And I do believe that I, I don't want to sound like a doomsday here, folks, because I'm incredibly optimistic, but I'm also speaking at a time when the markets are down 35%. So I believe that those are going to come back. I do believe that. And if you own them, ask yourself, why did you own them in the first place? Why did you own those companies? And if they've now become too risky for your portfolio, it might make a ton of sense to sell those positions and to replace them with quality Canadian equities that you know likely won't move as much. 
Um, I had a question uh, here about uh, safety of dividends. So this was a question that came in over online. I believe the guy, gentleman's name was Gary. Uh, Gary, I, I, I dug into your question. But Gary asked me, are there companies that have been paying dividends for 100 years? Are there companies that have been paying dividends for 100 years? Good to see you, Josh. Thanks for tuning in. Um, yes. So there are, there are, there are many. Um, specifically, the five that have not moved their dividends are, surprise, surprise, the Canadian banks. Now, on the U.S. side, um, so if I took a look at the Canadian banks, Bank, uh, Bank of Montreal has been paying since 1829, Bank of Nova Scotia since 1832, TD since 1857, CIBC since 1868, and Royal Bank since 1870. That's 150 years at least for all of those companies. They've never missed a dividend payment. So when we talk safety of dividends, I cannot see a situation, cannot see a situation where Canadian banks cut their dividend. Period. That's my point. That's the end of, of that's my point on that. So um, safety of dividends. Some people ask me now, what other companies might cut their dividends? Well, I think you'd be a fool to think that there won't be some dividend cuts in the oil and gas sector. Like that's happening. That that is happening. There will be some dividend cuts in the oil and gas sector. They've already started. You know, you got companies like Suncor that need a thirty dollar barrel of oil to, to you know to sustain, and most of those companies out there need way more than thirty dollar barrel of oil. But um, what can they do? First, they're going to cut their their expenditures, their capex. Then they're going to cut, or maybe they cut their dividend first. Cut the dividend, cut the capex. Um, Claude. You know what? I'll answer your question. Sorry. Sometimes I sit here and I just assume that everyone, um, you know, is on, you know, knows everything I'm talking about. But let's let's back it up a bit. What's a dividend? Is is the question coming up online? A dividend is a distribution that's issued by a company that is typically profits paid out to shareholders. Historically, that's what it's been. Um, so maybe you own a private company. Maybe you own, you know, Bill's Plumbing, and Bill's Plumbing had a really good year. And Bill's Plumbing is paying a dividend to the shareholders. And maybe the shareholders are Bill, his wife, and his son. And, you know, those three shareholders are collecting a dividend. But in the public space, you know, where stocks actually trade, what you get is declared dividend. So every quarter, you know, if I'm the CEO of a bank or a financial institution or a real estate, I say, you know, here's the dividend we're going to declare. We are going to pay X many cents. And historically, public company dividends from these multi you know these multi billion dollar companies they're extremely stable in how they want to emit their dividends and how they want to declare them so you rarely rarely get a dividend cut unless it's an extreme urgency or an emergency in the sector so typically you'll see that in the volatile sectors oil and gas being one of them um, but we typically won't see that kind of in the uh, in the financials. Like I, I can't imagine a situation where they would cut their dividend. Hopefully that answered your question, Claude. Can anyone here see a situation where they would cut a Canadian dividend? Do you guys see that? I personally don't. I personally don't. And again, my job here, um, my job here is not to be, uh, what's the episode in The Simpsons where Homer says to Marge, you know, Marge, you live in a world of make-believe with, you know, unicorns and fairies and, you know, you're not living in the real world. I want to make absolute sure that's a like 30 year old Simpsons reference, I think, but I want to make absolute sure that I am living in the real world. So when you tell me, if someone tells me, Rob, you know, you haven't thought of this, trust me, I have every single morning. All I do here is I talk to analysts, econo economists, that's a tough word for a francophone to say, economist, Economist. Um, we talk to our macro guys. We talk to our technical traders. I talk to different institutional portfolio managers, and I want to be talking to the actual people that are moving billions and millions and millions of millions of dollars. Because, you know, sometimes we get jaded as portfolio managers, right? You see the bad news. You see the bad news. So, I, I'm not trying to be a, a living in a world of make believe and, and unicorns. I'm as realist and as pragmatist as it can get. Prag, Matt, prag, pragmatist. Uh, anyway, so I, I take this incredibly seriously. Uh, I, I, I read a ton and um, I, I talk directly to the people who are making these decisions. I had a chat this morning uh, with one of the largest preferred share fund manager uh, in the country, one of the, and uh, we talked at length about the spreads on the, on the corporate yields and on the prefs and, you know, reminded me why that would make sense for who that would make sense. Um, 
I'm going to get to a question here. This is a, a couple questions. A couple times I've gotten this question here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at this question from Wolf here. Should we be sitting in cash here as we near the bottom? The answer is unequivocally no. Unequivocally. Okay. Um, let, me, let me extrapolate that a little bit too. Here's why. Because this is the emotional cycle. Okay. I printed this. You guys can't see it, but regardless, this is the emotional cycle. All right. Human beings, unfortunately, are the worst, worst, worst at making short term investment decisions. It's a fact because two things move the markets fear and greed. Okay. And right now, guess which one's moving the market? It's not greed, right? It's fear. It's extreme fear. People are freaking out. So this cycle happens. I have a video on this. I have a really good video on this. And I did it like two weeks before the crash happened. And uh, or maybe a week before the crash happened. I really like it. It's on my YouTube channel. Take a look at it. It talks about panic, desperation. And finally, the last one at the bottom, you get discouraged. What do you do right, right, right at the end of a market bottom? Capitulation. Capitulation is the word where everyone who wants to be out of the market is out. All right. Everyone who wants to be out is out. The only people that are left are individuals like you guys who are like, well, you know what? I got 50% of my portfolio in stocks. You know, I got some fixed income. I got some alternatives. Oh, I'm going to have to wait for this to come back. Right. That, that's, there's, I feel like there's a lot of that sentiment. Anyways, among my clients, you know, we were more defensive than most. So um, capitulation, capitulation will happen at some point. I don't think we're there yet. But to answer your question, um, Wolf, the reason we want to be invested right now is not because we know this is the bottom. In fact, one thing I know for a fact is that I don't know where the bottom is. I know that for a fact. Like, If somebody ever tells you for sure, for sure, for sure, they know where the bottom is, call BS on that right away because you don't know where the bottom is, okay? I guarantee you don't know where the bottom is because it's not moving on a rational basis. It's moving on emotions. And you don't know what emotions are. You don't know what everyone else is feeling in the entire planet. And plus, you get liquidity issues too, right? So back to the point about uh, getting out. So what happens inevitably is that people go, you know what, Rob? Or you know what, advisor? I can't do this, all right? I, I just, I know I only have 50% of my portfolio in stocks, but it's too much for me. You know, my husband or my wife is mad at me. I can't do this. Just sell me out of here and I'm okay with just these losses. Okay. And there's a bunch of that that happens. There's a bunch of that that happens. And when the last person who decided they want to be out is out, that's when once you have the reverse of, of what's happening now. Now you have no more sellers. Okay. And when you have no more sellers, like actually no more people that are selling, the people that want to be out are out. And the people that believe in it long term, like me and like all of you, are still in. Then you get the opposite that happens. You get people on the sidelines that are like, you know what? I've been sitting on a million bucks here. I'm going to put it in the market. You get buyers. You get institutional. You get smart money, like Warren Buffett. You guys remember in March 2009 when the market was hitting all time, or I should say, big, big, big lows. The market had corrected 57 percent. You know, one of the key turning points in moving that market, as crazy as this is is when Warren Buffett said, you know what? I'm going to put my cash to work. I'm going to start buying companies right now. That was, I believe, the week before or the week of. And uh, lo and behold, the market started turning, right? Because now you have no sellers. You have no sellers. And, you know, $100 billion here, $100 billion here. Um, so, you know, the money starts creeping in and then you get bids, right? And no sellers. So you get the reverse happen. Now, don't get me wrong. It never happens as quickly as it does on the way down. It never does. The, the drop that we just saw in the last month, that's unprecedented. And we will not see that on the way back. Mark my word. We will not see it on the way back. But what we don't want to do to answer your question about sitting in the sidelines is what we don't want to do is miss that. Okay. We don't want to miss that. The reason being the largest positive days ever are always occurring in bear markets. Bear markets are what we're seeing right now. So the largest positive days always occur on the outswing of a bear market. And that might be a 10% day. It might be a 12% day. It might be a 15% day. And if you miss that one day, 
you know, you've missed your entire year's worth of returns. So the opportunity cost of you being out of the market, you being out of the market and not getting that return is just not worth it, right? So we we don't know how close we are to the bottom. I, I don't know. My gut feel says that we're we're getting there. You know, I have a lot of conversations with a lot of people, and you know, I, I do sense that we are getting there. Um, but again, I don't know, and I don't want to. I don't want to lie to you guys. All right. So I, I truly don't know. But I know that you know we monitor a lot of a lot of signals, right? Like some of the some of the uh, signals we monitor are leverage, right? How much leverage? How much leverage is in the markets right now? You know who? And we're approaching. So we want to have a net negative leverage situation. That's a, that's a really good indicator of the bottom, right? Um, and then just straight up corrections, right? Uh, how much percentage, how much buying are we seeing? We saw the largest outflow to cash in January, uh, 28, uh, in 2018, we saw a bit of a correction. It was about 20% or so. We saw the largest influx to cash in January. So after the market started recovering, people were getting out and going to cash. So where is the bottom? Again, my answer to you is we will get to the bottom in my mind before we get the cure, the virus, the flattening of the curve uh, of COVID because the market is pricing in something that may happen at some point. I know it's scary right now. Trust me, guys. I know it's brutal when my kids can't go outside and play with their neighbors. And, you know, we're, we're, we're all trying to, we're all trying to do our part to flatten the curve. And, you know, you haven't had a beer with a buddy in forever. And like, I know it's brutal. And that's part of what is bringing the market down. So to answer your question, I feel like my dad now, I'm giving like 10 minute answers to questions. Um, to answer your question, we don't, we, because we don't know where the bottom is, but because we know that we're extremely close to it, the opportunity cost of being outside the market is just way too large of a risk to your portfolio. If you have a portfolio that is well-constructed for you and as well-constructed for your risk tolerance and for your cash needs, you'll be fine, folks. And I hate to tell you this. I hate to sound like... I hate to sound like a broken record and I hate to sound like, you know, the guy on the TV, but hopefully the logic makes sense to you. Why we actually wait, why we actually wait in these periods of time, because once it turns, you don't want to miss that party. You do not want to miss that party. Let's get to the next question here. Um, how much of a big fall is caused by robo selling? Really good question. Um, how many here uh, have an account with a robo advisor? Good to see you, uh, Justin, uh, Christelle. Who else is on there? Other people as well. So here's what happened with robo advisors. I don't know if you saw this, but there's there's a couple things that happened with robo advisors. First of all, when you sign up to become a client of a robo advisor, you get a quiz. The quiz then forms your asset allocation, and the rebalancing happens at the same intervals. So when they're rebalancing, they all kind of sell at the same time. They all generally go to cash or go to fixed income at the same time. So what happens when robos and algorithms are selling across the board, like you can't have a movement of a thousand points in 20 seconds in a market without it being partly algorithms and partly non-human. Like to me, that's extremely obvious, but you know, we had a day here a week and a half ago where the, the, the one minute chart on our screen look like you know something had fallen off the cliff so you had a stock that fell you know 20 percent or 15 percent in one minute you know that means you have people you know i guess aggressively selling that stock during you know a 20 second period of time so i don't know the answer i'm not a conspiracy theorist guys i'm a i'm a, again i'm a realist i know what's happening all over the place and i know that they're um they're happening it's happening but how much of it is robo? I don't know, but it, it's certainly a part of it. Party, certainly a part of it. Um, you guys, how are you guys feeling about your portfolio? I know that's a tough question today, sitting here in my chair, um, when you know we're we're trying to protect capital for you guys, and you guys are the ones that are actually seeing the statement, seeing the online uh, exposure. Have any of you guys capitulated? Have any of you guys kind of sold off and said, "I'm going to go to cash. That's enough for me." 
there's a question here. It's probably a joke, but when people start jumping out the window, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Not going to happen here. That's for sure. Um, you know, capitulation, <laughs> capitulation is not something, I mean, for me, when a client calls, we give our best possible advice. We, we tell them, you know, the absolute best, what we think uh, they can do. But if someone is, is absolutely at, at the world's end with respect to capitulation, you know, th there's oftentimes nothing we can do, but we do know that we're that much closer to the bottom. And there's my uncle Papa Lou saying no capitulating for me. Good to hear Papa Lou. Um, now, extremely optimistic about the opportunities that are being present. Yeah, we had talked a bit about opportunities earlier, uh, opportunities that are being present. Um, someone had asked me a, a quick question about a recession versus a depression. Does anyone know the difference? Anyone want to tell me what the difference is between a recession? First of all, what's a recession? We know this, right? Yeah. Recession, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. So that is going to happen in Canada for sure. I'm going to get to your question in a sec here, Claude. Um, first of all, I'll just get to this uh, uh, recession depression. So the a recession, two consecutive quarters, negative GDP growth. Hey, guys, uh, I don't want to be uh, Einstein here and the most clairvoyant uh, portfolio manager ever but we're probably going to get a recession in Canada, guys, in case you guys hadn't known that. Um, we will get two quarters of negative growth. They can almost bank on it. As my dad says, will it get dark tonight? Yeah, it's probably going to get dark tonight. Um, depression, it, there's no kind of formal definition, but it's typically known as three consecutive years of negative GDP growth with a 10% reduction in GDP growth. Like that would be just, I don't think that, I don't think we're going that way. Personally, I do not think we're going that way. I think there's going to be a recession, but I do think a ton of stimulus uh, is going to do some wonders for our economy once we deal with uh, COVID. Um, there's a question here from uh, leveraging. Uh, so leveraging, everyone know what leveraging is? Real dig show? Leveraging? So we use the word leveraging. Has anyone here leveraged? I've done it personally in my account. So leveraging um, is when you borrow to invest. It is the word from a basic machine, a lever, a levier en français. Pour ceux qui savent pas, je francophone. Y a-t-il des francophones ici? Yeah, cup de francophone. For sure, for sure, y a des francophones. But thanks for. I'm, I'm going to stick to English, even though my my francophone friends are are, are um, in big numbers here today. So. You're using your, your, your borrowing either from your margin account, from a bank, from your line of credit, from your house, uh, and you are borrowing money and then you're putting that in the market. So the, the idea with leveraging is that you're going to make phenomenal returns most of the time. Most of the time, you're going to make a ton of money because you're borrowing at extremely cheap, extremely cheap right now, right? You could buy, you could borrow money for the cheapest probably that you've not probably, the cheapest that you've ever been able to borrow money at. Um, I like all the little, the, the the waves from all the Francos. Thank you, Joe Martin, Makuru, uh, all right, a lot, lot of Francos out there. But So you're borrowing, you're borrowing money, you're putting that to work. So you're borrowing at 0.1% and you're putting it to work. So as long as your money is generating more than 0.1%, you're going to be way ahead. That's why they call it a lever, because you move it a little bit and it moves a ton on the other side. Now, it's a two-way street. There's no free lunch, right? So the same thing that happens on the way up happens on the way down. So when you're borrowing, you're investing more than you actually have. Well, you get hammered on the way down with leverage as well, which is why we always practice prudent leveraging. And we don't have many clients that are leveraged, but if they do, we've kind of been practicing deleveraging at some point. Now, at this point, Stephen, to answer your question, if there's no other cash anywhere else and this and a, and a margin call will come. Does anyone know what a margin call is? Has anyone seen the movie? I think there's a movie called Margin Call. Is that a movie? I feel like that might be a movie. There's all these movies from uh, the stock market world that I don't know. Um, I feel like that's a movie. No one's no one's verifying that for me. But basically, what happens with a margin call is you have assets, and then you have a loan. And once your loan once the value of your assets becomes more than your loan, 
they call you ring ring who's on the phone well it's me and i want you to sell your stocks because you're over margined or you're under margined i should say uh, so they've forced you to sell your securities and guess when you're selling your securities always when the market's at an all-time low they call it a squeeze um, and then typically you know you have that day or two days to sell maybe three days to sell usually it's not that and then otherwise they just sell you out of the positions so now you're selling at the absolute bottom and you still have the loan to pay so if you can't afford it on a cash flow basis you have to be extremely careful with margin so to answer your question um, right now if you had no other access to capital of any kind uh, a tfsa or something that you could put in to add liquidity to your portfolio I'd be extremely, extremely careful. I'd want to take a second look at your portfolio. If you're max leveraged and you're getting margin calls, time to make some big, big decisions here. Um, that was a leverage question. Thanks for that question. Uh, I'm going to get back to the, uh, the bubble question. People have been asking me about bubbles, um, cannabis, uh, cryptocurrency, etc. How many people here have cryptocurrency in their portfolio? got to be some of you that have some cryptocurrency in your portfolio five percent ten percent how about some cannabis in their portfolio nobody wants to admit that because cannabis is is uh is down incredibly um wow they're down like 90 percent. i hate to tell you this folks but i called this one um you know you've probably seen my my bnn clips i i've been telling people that the cannabis bubble would blow at some point. It's going to blow, um, much like the tulip bubble in the 1400s in Holland. Um, the cannabis bubble, I think, was poised to blow, and it did, and now we're at a 90% correction. Um, real quick, just got a question about my favorite market movie, my favorite stock market movie. Well, well, well. Um, what's the one, what's the movie with the guy... Uh, the guy who's like he's in a in a he's doing cold calls and he's like a rookie it's that guy from i think it's matt damon is it matt damon uh not rounders boiler room is that a movie boiler room that's a really really good movie what about um i mean if you just want entertainment wolf of uh wolf of wall street is, is i mean there are some funny parts in there uh, Boiler Room, yes, yes. Leonardo DiCaprio, that's Wolf of Wall Street. Um, what are some of the other ones? There's uh, my dad's favorite, for sure, for sure, is, uh, oh, what is it, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? That's not really a, a, an investment movie, but it's like, show me the leads. I want the leads. Um, that's a Baldwin who's in that movie. The Big Short is one that's good. Also, Adam Buss, thank you for that one. The Big Short. Uh, isn't that? um michael scott in that movie michael scott's in that movie yeah he's uh he's the guy i think or he's one of the guys uh steve carell um you know I, I i should probably watch more movies i don't watch much movies or much tv these days um but i digress if you have other favorite movies please put them in here who else do we got none over here big short charlie sheen yeah wall street obviously yeah wall street is a is an automatic charlie sheen he was uh was that his real life back then? Did he get caught into a drug uh, drugs problem in that movie? But I digress. Um, can, someone, can someone remind me what I was talking about? Uh, I just went on a tangent here and I was talking. Oh, yeah, bubbles. Oh, yeah, bubbles. So if you own assets in some of those bubbles, you now have to be very cognizant of the fact that some of those companies are going to go bankrupt. All right. Some of those companies are going to go bankrupt. Some of those cannabis companies, I don't know which ones, and I'm not going to talk about individual companies here today but some of them will go bankrupt for sure um we're talking here about us dollar us stock market okay so peter peter ends is asking me about investing in the us market i think he's asking me without currency exposure so there's a fairly easy way you can do that i mean you could put a hedge on your portfolio right start hedging all of your investments um so in other words you know you buy forwards and, and futures on the Canadian and US currency. No, you don't want to do that. I, I just, it's not going to be possible. Instead, what you do, you buy an ETF, US exposed ETF, hedge to the Canadian dollar. Now, there's a few of those that exist. Um, XQQ, I got to be careful. I'm not giving you advice, but if you're looking for general specific ETFs, they exist. XSP, XQQ, 
There's a bunch of them that exist that are hedged for the Canadian dollar. Uh, so you could buy it in Canadian dollars and you get the exposure, direct exposure um, to the sector. Um, so that's one, um, that's one way you can do it. I would also take a look at, I mean, some of the, you have to be careful if converting a whole bunch of currency. So if you want to just convert a whole bunch of currency and you're like, ah, you know what? I'm just going to buy us stocks right now with this currency, be prepared for the currency risk, right? Because if the U S dollar goes the other way, you're probably going to be, well, you're going to get hurt. Uh, alternatives. And then I'll get into the gold sector. So maybe I'll start with gold sector. There's a question here about Barrick, um, some companies uh, closing. So the gold prices, I look at my screen here today, they're up like, they were up like 50 bucks today. Um, I, and again, I'm not a huge believer of owning bullion. In fact, I'm not a believer of owning bullion. I recognize that some of you on there are saying that bullion is a great hedge. It's a good hedge against inflation. It's a good hedge against the stock market. I get it. I understand that. But we've also gone through periods of, you know, 10 years or whatever with zero return. Um, I'm okay with owning gold companies that are profitable and that have a solid balance sheet. Those are also act as a good hedge relative to, you know, relative to just owning straight equity. So, you know, are gold stocks fully priced in right now? Are they, are you getting all the bang for your buck that you can with a gold stock? You know, that sector, some of those companies are not going to survive. Some of those companies are going to get beat up. There's going to be some damage there too. There's going to be some blood there. So just be very, very careful which companies you're investing in there. Because they're not all, they're not all that safe and guaranteed. Um, question about alternative investments. So alternative investments depends what you own in the alternative space. The question is, are alternative investments risky? Generally, my answer here is no. Depending on what you own, it can be. So if you own liquid alts, if you own a hedge fund, those are risky alternatives, right? Like some of those alternatives, you don't know what, what the portfolio manager can do. He can buy and sell the entire portfolio and go long, go short. You have to be extremely careful because you're effectively trusting someone with like to gamble with your money. So hedge funds had a heyday in the 70s, 80s, 90s. We see them less now. Um, now you're seeing more what's called liquid alternatives or pure, uh, pure alpha funds or straight, you know, uncorrelated risk funds, stuff like that where the portfolio manager is trying to generate a return irregardless of what's happening in the market. The other alternatives that I'm a really big fan of is private real estate. If you're my client, you've heard me talk about this in the past. Um, you've heard me talk about it at length on BNN, you know, on here on the markets. Private real estate, in my view, uh, is going to have, um, well, they're going to dramatically outperform, right? So with that in mind, I think, they have done well. They kept their value right now. It depends what you own. If you own retail, if you own residential, if you own, you know, commercial. I don't know what you own in the in the in the private REIT space. But if you own, like, people are going to need to pay their rent, right? So if you own multifamily private real estate investment trusts, there may be a period of time where some people aren't able to pay their rents. Absolutely, that that's possible. But you still own the real estate, right? So you're likely to be very, very, very fine. Um, I'm I'm going to be wrapping it up real soon here my uh my Instagram live is telling me that I'm I've hit the limit. I guess there's a limit of time here that you can chat on this thing. Um I'm going to take maybe uh one or so more question and then I'm just going to give you my last thoughts about this guys. Um So the question here is direct ownership in rental properties or funds like Centurion Apartment REIT. So I believe in both depending on who you are. Maybe it makes more sense to own it directly through a limited partnership or directly through a fund manager, or maybe even through a publicly traded real estate investment trust. I don't know. I don't know what your situation is, but they can make sense for every single investor. We've been preaching defensive assets for a while. We continue to believe that defensive assets will outperform in this next market cycle. Mind you, now that we've fallen 35%, how do you define the next market cycle? Um, so yeah, we, you could do it in a whole bunch of different ways. So I'm just going to recap here some of my thoughts for today. We're going to do this again, guys. Um, I'm here. I'm available. I, I, I want to be able to talk to you, my clients, and to talk to you guys, everyone else. So first of all, there will be a turn at some point. There will be a turn at some point. And when that does happen, 
the market will do remarkable after that. Now, I don't know when that bottom is, but it will happen. Those of you on Instagram, I'm going to say bye now because I'm running out of time, apparently. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in. Um, there will be a time that's going to turn. It's going to turn. And when it does turn, you're going to be happy you're invested. We don't know where the bottom is. Therefore, you'd rather be invested than not. If you have spare cash, if you have spare cash, we recommend a prudent strategy, prudent strategy to deploy that capital using high quality assets. We're not speculators. We're not gambling. We're advising you that that's what you should be doing. Finally, Johnny Mox is asking a question. What is Warren Buffett doing at a time like this? He is licking his chops. He is sitting on, what is it, $150 billion of cash, straight cash, homie. And uh, he's going to be deploying that. He's going to be buying companies. He can buy entire sectors in the market. Um, and he's going to be making, uh, I think, a ton of money for himself and for his shareholders in the future. So thanks so much, guys. I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com. You know my YouTube channel. You know my Instagram channel. It's at Rob Tatro. My Facebook is Rob Tatro. Uh, we're going to do this again, I would imagine. So thanks so much for tuning in. Next week, we'll take some more questions. Thanks, guys.